Good morning, everyone from Las Vegas, or good afternoon, wherever you're at in the world. I'm Dr. Josh Bondi. I am the Director of Research here at the Nevada Science Center. So I'm going to be talking a little bit today about uh, my career in becoming a paleontologist, what I do as a paleontologist. And then at the end, I'll open it up for questions for any of you aspiring paleontologists or anybody who just has questions about what the field is all about, what the science is all about. And we'll obviously do some show and tell. I've got some cool fossils back here behind me as well. So what is a paleontologist? I'm sure many of you who are in, the, in your classrooms right now, there might be some hands that are popping up about you know, exactly what a paleontologist is. Uh, if you have any questions, send them in the, have your teacher or, or if you are on your own computer, type them into the chat and, and Ralph, Mr. Krause, he'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so what is a paleontologist? A paleontologist studies ancient life. Some paleontologists or some geologists say that it has to be anything that used to be living at least 10,000 years ago. I've studied fossils that are about 9,000 years old. I've studied fossils that are about 5,000 years old. And I still consider those fossils. And so my definition, uh, unlike the textbook definition, is that it's just any remains of previously existing life. And that could be plants, that could be algae, it could be bugs, it could be mammoths, it could be dinosaurs. So anything that used to be alive falls under the realm of paleontology. And so the specific type of paleontology I do has a really uh, unique term, it's called taphonomy. And so taphonomy is all of the processes by which a dead thing becomes fossil. And so if any of you remember the old TV show, or if your parents remember the old TV show of CSI, it's kind of like that. And so you kind of look at all the remains of what's still there and you try to piece back how that animal, how that plant lived when it was alive in its ecosystem. So to be a good paleontologist, paleontology kind of falls on the fence where it's, you have to know a lot of geology and you have to know a lot of biology. So if you are looking at becoming a paleontologist and going on to college, you need to study lots of rocks because fossils are found in rocks and you need to know the context in which they're found in. Uh, whether or not it's a sandstone could tell you that that animal died in a river versus a shale or maybe that that animal died in a lake or at the bottom of the ocean, or a limestone where that animal may have been living in a reef. And so it's really important to know the rocks. And it's also really important to know the biology as well. So you need to know the anatomy of the animals. So are you looking at an arm bone? Are you looking at a leg bone? Are you looking at a jaw? And then of what type of animal? Similarly with plants, what type of leaves are you looking at? Are you looking at uh, leaves of a magnolia tree? Are you looking at pine needles? Are you looking at pine cones? So it's really important to know both geology and biology. So my path to becoming a paleontologist. Uh, I grew up on a family farm up in Northern Nevada. So about an hour east of Reno in the town of Fallon. Uh, I always really liked the outdoors. Growing up, my parents used to take us camping for family vacations. So we would go out and about and just go hiking around the mountains, go fishing in some of the little mountain streams in central Nevada and go visit family members. And I really enjoyed the outdoors. I was really intrigued by science as well. So when I was about eight or nine, my parents took me to a museum in the Bay Area. It's called the Lawrence Hall of Science at the University of California in Berkeley. And they have these great big life-size animatronic dinosaurs. And as a little guy, it really scared me being in front of like, especially the life-size allosaur that was, you know, in hindsight, it was probably kind of a clunky machine, but it was life-size and it would roar. And it really scared me at the time. And so I decided at that moment, I was gonna figure out dinosaurs. And so from that point on, and not everyone's the same way, lots of people find paleontology at different stages in their life, but that's when I was hooked. Uh, I have friends and colleagues who were full grown adults, had completely different careers, and then decided that paleontology was their calling. Uh, one of my friends, he was an insurance agent, successful, decided to completely change careers, become a paleontologist. Another one of my friends, she was a camp cook. And so she would go out to uh, ranches and stuff like that and make meals for all the cowboys and when they come into camp. And she got hired on as a camp cook in a dinosaur dig in Northern Montana. And she ended up getting her PhD in paleontology and became a world expert in what she did. So it doesn't matter when you get the bug, you can always become a paleontologist. So I guess that's the takeaway there. Uh, my education, so I went to the University of Nevada, Reno, and got a, my bachelor's or my undergraduate degree in biology. 
And so that's learning all the different aspects of the ecology of where these animals live, where these plants and animals live in the past. I went on to Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana, and uh, got a master's degree in earth sciences. And then I came back to Nevada and got a PhD in geology. And I spent some time as a professor at a local university. I spent some time as a curator. And uh, I decided with my partner, Becky, that we were going to start our own science center. And so that's what we do here is that we do outreach programs like the one you're watching now. And we also go conduct original research. So as paleontologists and as outreach folks, it's important to be part of the story. And so you can always, it's always easier to tell a story if you were there, right? So say your little brother or your little sister is telling a story at the dinner table at night. It's a lot more interesting story if they're actually a part of it than if they're just trying to tell a story that the teacher told them, right? So same thing with science is if we're part of the science, we can tell better stories being a part of it than telling somebody else's story secondhand. All right. So how, what are some of these stories that we're working on? So I'll go through a couple of these projects that are behind me here. One question that we get all the time when people come through the Science Center is what's the oldest fossils uh, that you have? And so here we have, this is a trilobite. So this particular animal is from Esmeralda County, Nevada, which is on the far western side of the state, right on the California state line. And it's about 530 million years old, which means this animal was scurrying about the bottom of the ocean half a billion years ago here in Nevada. It's kind of like a bug. Uh, it would have looked kind of like a horseshoe crab. These animals went extinct about uh, 300 million years ago. But the cool thing is, even though this thing's half a billion years old, you can faintly make out the blood vessels in its head. So really well preserved. Here in Las Vegas, we recently found or Becky recently found this little thing in the green here. So see this long line here? There's some very faint little sidelines coming off of it. We don't know what this comes from. So there's, and this is also about the same age, about 500 to 520 million years old. And we're working with some colleagues in Utah who are experts in rocks of this time period to try to figure out what these are. And so these are some of the interesting stories that we're still working on. So that's the fun part about science is that uh, it's okay to not know the answer. It's okay to keep working on these things. These are all ongoing research projects for a reason, and that we're still working on them. All right, some other cool stuff. I like this one. Not everyone's a fan of it, but we like it. Let's see if I got it. So this little, let's see if I can get it on the screen, put the right light. Here we go. All right, so this kind of world shape here is a really primitive type of relative of the modern chambered nautilus called an ammonite. And so these are prolific animals that lived during the age of dinosaurs in the, in the shallow tropical seas of North America and around the world. They probably would look something more similar to this when they were alive. And so these things were cruising around all the global oceans when dinosaurs were dominating the land. Uh, we do have some plant fossils as well. So here we have a pretty 10 million year old leaf from near, uh, I think this one's from near Pyramid Lake up in Washoe County, uh, Nevada. We have some 110 million year old petrified wood from uh, the Cretaceous period up near Eureka County, Nevada. So we do plant stories as well. Let's see, down here. In Churchill County, Nevada, which is my home county, this is a little backbone and the head to a 12 million year old stickleback fish. And so these are found in diatomaceous earth quarries up there, uh, just outside of the town, of between the towns of Fallon and Fernley. They use this, they mine this material, it's really light uh, for filters. And so they fil filter your soda with stuff. Other interesting fossils. This bone is a hundred million year old dinosaur bone. 
And this one was found in Valley Fire State Park by Becky uh, a year and a half ago now. So we're still studying it. We're still piecing this back together. We've shown it. Look, this thing is just for scale. I'm a little bit over six foot tall. And this one bone is almost as long as my entire arm. Uh, we've shown this to a couple of experts. And some ideas are one toe bone from an enormous dinosaur. So this one was found in Valley Fire State Park here in Clark County in Southern Nevada. Uh, again, about 100 million years old. So another one of these stories we're still trying to tease out from the rocks. Make sure it doesn't fall. You gotta be careful when you're taking care of these old fossils. Uh, if you wanna follow me around. So in doing taphonomy and studying how fossils are preserved in the fossil record, uh, the hardest parts are usually the parts that get preserved most commonly. So if you think of all the hardest parts of your body, is it your muscles? Some of you might think your muscles are really hard. They're not, especially geologically. Uh, but like your bones are really hard. What's even harder than bone? Our teeth. So the teeth are actually the hardest part of your body. And so they're also the most common types of fossils that we find of animals in the fossil record. So this, are teeth of a duck-billed dinosaur. So these are also about 100 million years old from Valley of Fire State Park. So this is gonna be a new species of dinosaur that uh, our executive director, Becky, is working on right now, uh, one of her research projects. And then we, also, we have some other bones, like this is a backbone from the same animal. So your backbones are probably about EA big around. This is a great big animal. This animal was probably about 25 feet long, I imagine the longest. Uh, down here, uh, I don't know if you can see that real well. Uh, this is part of a four tusk elephant skull. This is about 14 million years old. So what you're looking at here is uh, a, the roots of some teeth. This is a completely worn flat tooth. And then these are the, where the tusks would be coming out. So another weird animal that used to live here in Nevada, Esmeralda County, 14 million years ago. And then just because it's after breakfast time here in Nevada and right before lunchtime, kind of a fun fossil we're working on right now. Let's see if I can get it out of the tube, or maybe because I don't think it'll show up on the camera very well. Let's see. How many of you know what a maggot is? I'm imagining there's a number of hands going up in classrooms and in front of computer screens around the, the world right now. Icky, right? The first reaction you have is icky. Maggots are baby flies, larva flies. When they get on garbage and things like that, they start growing and they're just nasty. You imagine, have you ever heard of a fossil maggot? Probably not because these are brand new to science and it's one of our research projects. So I get the screen to focus on that. So this little rain of, grain of rice thing is a 14 million year old maggot that was found in an elephant skull. It's been completely replaced by quartz. And so even though it's kind of, would have been a really icky animal in real life, it's interesting scientifically in that we're preserving this little soft organism for millions of years. And so this is actually a new paper we're writing right now. It is presented at a national conference. So. We have lots of cool stories going on uh, here at the Science Center. I have another fun story I always get, or fun question I get from everybody who comes and visits or asks what we do here at the Science Center. What's the oldest fossil? Show me the oldest fossil. That's the trilobite, right? That weird bug-like thing. The other question, what's the biggest fossil you work on? This is a tusk to a Colombian mammoth. So this tusk came from the Las Vegas area. So right here in Southern Nevada, if you follow it from the tip all the way around to the base, this tusk is over seven feet long. So it's longer than I am tall, which means the animal it came from, my teaching prop here, the animal that it came from must have also been about eight feet, seven feet tall here at the shoulder, and then probably you know, 10 feet tall to the, to the crest of the skull. 
So this animal lived here in Southern Nevada during the ice age. So probably up to about 10,000 years ago where we have casinos across the Las Vegas Valley today, 10,000 years ago, there would have been herds of mammoths making their way across this landscape. So these are just some of the stories that we're working on here in, at the Nevada Science Center in terms of paleontology and my path to being a paleontologist. So if anyone has any questions about my story or if I have any questions about the prehistory of Nevada or what we do here at the Nevada Science Center, uh, I'd be happy to entertain those questions now. Yeah, absolutely. We have a question from Mav in Italy, and um, it kind of you you touched on the oral, like the storytelling, and she wanted to know a little bit about your story, uh, specifically your heritage, and kind of. Uh, I'll, I'll let her go ahead and unmute and ask those very. Uh, it was very well thought. Go ahead, Mav. Hi, Josh. Hello. Um, could you explain how life of the Timok band of Western Shoshone native tribe where you were born and raised works? And please, if you can, could you summarize in some principal point what you have learned um, there and thanks to the Nevada territory? Thank you. You bet. Um, so yeah, I'm a member of the Timok band of Western Shoshone. And so it's a band of, of Native Americans for anyone who's from outside the U.S. who extended our range was extended our ancestral lands were essentially from Yellowstone National Park to Death Valley National Park so kind of a big crescent shape across Nevada and so my my family comes from the northeastern part of the state so my tribe is actually based out of Elko County which again is the far northeastern county in the state of Nevada uh, it's been an interesting journey let not lots of minorities go into the sciences historically and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to show especially students, a lot of you who are sitting in your classrooms right now, but you can look however you want to look, you can be whoever you want to be, and you can be a scientist. And so I happen to be a Native American, and I'm very proud of that, but I'm also a scientist. And so regardless of what your background is, regardless of how you identify yourself, there's lots of room in the sciences for you. That is uh, great advice. And, um, you know, we couldn't be more honored to be able to connect with you. And, you know, you have such a cool, rich history and heritage. And, it, you know, it's absolutely fascinating. We, we have a question from Mathis Elementary, and they wanted to know, how are you guys able to figure out how old something is? That is a fantastic question. So uh, whoever got that, I hope your teacher gives you some extra credit for asking that one. So how do we, how do we know how old a fossil is? A lot of you have probably heard of radiocarbon dating. So radiocarbon dating which works really good when you have more recent stuff that hasn't turned to rock yet. This mammoth tusk is not that old, so we can get a radiocarbon date on the tusk, on this Ice Age ivory. And so radiocarbon works good to about 50,000 years ago. Anything older than 50,000 years old, we need to date uh, usually things like volcanic ash or lava flows. And so when we find say a hundred million year old dinosaur bone we can't get a date on the dinosaur bone but what we can do is we can find a nearby volcanic ash which has naturally occurring radioactive minerals in it and we date how much of that radioactive material is left in this which is found nearby to this and it tells us roughly how old these dinosaurs are. And so that's how we get dates. I say this is 100 million years old because this ash was found nearby this dinosaur, and that ash is actually 100 million years old. This might be a short answer, but there's a, a third grade class that wanted to know, have you ever found a pterodactyl? That is a great question. So uh, I know you want a short answer, and I'm not very good at short answers. But pterodactyls actually have really delicate bones that are more delicate than bird bones. We're looking for them. We've looked all over Nevada so far up for them. It's only a matter of time, but no, I have not found a pterodactyl bone. Very good. And we have a question from Miss Quinn's class at Pinecrest Academy of Nevada Cadence Campus. And there's a number of other students here in Nevada who have asked the same question. Miss Quinn, I'm unmuting you right now. So are you your uh, student can ask that great question. Thank you. Uh, which fossil is your favorite fossil and why? What is my favorite fossil and why? 
That is a great question. I'm gonna to have to think about this for a second. Um, we went through lots of really fun ones, right? So we've got mammoth tusks, we've got dinosaur bones. Can you see or show? Let me see. I don't know if that'll show up or no, I don't think it's gonna show up. Uh, we don't have a we don't have one of them in the lab right now, but my favorite project that I just published on my, my most recent paper on was on fossil frogs. So everybody likes frogs, right? Well, we have frogs that lived during the age of dinosaurs, the very end of the age of dinosaurs near the, in White Pine County near Ely, Nevada. And these little frogs survived the end Cretaceous extinction. So when dinosaur, when non furred dinosaurs go extinct, these little frogs survive. And so we find them throughout this entire geologic area. And they just look like they got run over on the road yesterday. They're just flat squished, complete frogs. And so those are probably my favorite ones. That's awesome. We have a question from Miss Wolfley's class, and uh, they're they're out in Logandale. Uh, so I know you guys have traveled all over the state, and so those of you who aren't in Nevada, who are in another another country, uh, we have large populace in southern Nevada, and we have these rural counties and and all that kind of stuff. And so they want to know: Do you guys, do you and Becky, ever travel outside of Nevada to do any uh, digs? Um. It's been a number of years since I've been outside of the state to do a dig. Uh, most of our work, because we're the Nevada Science Center, most of our permits, most of our work is within the state of Nevada. Uh, but I've done work in Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, California, a little bit in Arizona. So I get around, especially the Western US, and Becky comes along and does work in California and a couple of other states as well. Uh, so we are active outside of Nevada, but the, the focus of our, our direct research today is our we're trying to get the word of Nevada science out to the world. And you guys are doing a phenomenal job. And again, if you want to uh, check out the great work that Josh and Becky are doing, check out sciencecenternevada.org. Uh, speaking of California, we had an awesome question from the state of California, some, some students out there, and it was uh, also asked by a third grade class right here in Nevada. And they want to know, how come you guys can still find these fossils if they're tens of millions of years old? That's a great question. So how do we find fossils if they're tens of millions of years old? Uh, an animal or a plant has to die in a very specific set of circumstances in order to be replaced by minerals. And so what we're finding are just a very slim fraction of the life that's ever existed on this planet. So if you think of all the animals, all the plants that live around you, whether you're in Las Vegas, you're in Reno, you're in San Diego, all the plants and animals that live around you right now, almost none of that's gonna be preserved in the geological record. So it's only a very tiny fraction of anything that ever gets preserved. And that's what we look for. And so it's when those animals and plants sign those very particular sets of circumstances that they become replaced by quartz, like in the case of that maggot, uh, get replaced by the mineral calcite in some cases. And so we need the special sets, uh, special sets of circumstances geologically in order to preserve our fossils. Um, so uh, we had, uh, we're getting a lot of questions that are, are somewhat the same, but these questions are from multiple places. And so uh, this, there's a student in France and then there's, a, there's some students right here in Nevada that want to know what kind of dinosaurs were once sea creatures that you would have found in Nevada? That's a great question. So the first way I'll answer that is I'll clear something up, is that Dinosaurs actually never went back to the seas. So all dinosaurs were terrestrial organisms, they're called. So they lived in land ecosystems. So even Spinosaurus, which was actually kind of a swimmer, like an expert in swimming, uh, it actually lived in rivers. It didn't ever, ever actually go back to seas. So, but there are a group of reptiles, which during the age of dinosaurs, evolved into those ecological niches that are today filled by dolphins and whales. So even though they're not dinosaurs, they are reptiles and they live in the ocean. So our state fossil here in Nevada is actually an ichthyosaur, which means fish lizard. And so these were reptiles that went to the sea, but adapted to the sea during the age of dinosaurs. They go extinct also during the Cretaceous. This one, Shonosaurus popularis, again, a uh, Nevada state fossil. This uh, marine reptile got up to 50 feet long. And so the backbones on this thing 
are the size of dinner plates. Miners in the historic mining town of Berlin actually used their backbones as dinner plates. So here's another teaching prop to show an ichthyosaur. So four flippers kind of looks like a dolphin, kind of looks like a whale. That's because these are the same adaptations for living in those environments. Other types of marine reptiles that went to the ocean during the age of dinosaurs, turtles. And so sea turtles are first appear in the, in the dawn of the age of dinosaurs. And mosasaurs, which are giant Komodo dragons that went back to the oceans as well, got up to 30 feet long. And then plesiosaurs, which are kind of inspiration for the Loch Ness monster, for anybody who knows that story. Long neck, four flippers, also a, not a dinosaur, but a marine reptile during that period of time. That's uh, very, very interesting stuff. We have uh, a few more questions and then we'll let you go. We have Inez, Inez out in Spain. Uh, Inez, you should be able to unmute. I, I was wondering this myself and I thought it was a great question. Um, when and why did you decide to become a paleontologist and what did you like the best about your job? All right, so when and why did I become a paleontologist? So I was, I was inspired by or intrigued by the story of life when I was in elementary school. So like I said earlier, about eight or nine years old. I read everything I could. I read every single dinosaur book I could get my hands on. Uh, every single dinosaur special my parents would let me watch, I watched. And um, I was just hooked from a kid and that just never kind of went away. And my parents fostered that through my professional career. And lo and behold, I became a paleontologist. What do I like most about my job? There's a couple aspects that I could answer that with. So on a professional side, these are really intriguing questions still. So even though I was intrigued as a kid, probably by just the size and the scale of prehistoric animals, now it's the stories. Like, why did that magnet get preserved? Like, that's never a question I thought I would ask as a kid, but it's a question I ask now as a scientist because it's interesting to me. So it's fulfilling and telling these stories. On a personal level, I get paid to go camping. <laughs> so I get to go out in the middle of these beautiful areas I get to work with amazing people and I get to work with work with these amazing people also to tell these stories scientifically and share the story with you. So in that regard, it's both professionally and personally fulfilling to do what we do. So uh, we have a question from a student at Mathis Elementary and they want to know how did the aquatic animals die? Um, is did like was there just a drying out of the water or uh, what is the hypothesis there? So the leading hypothesis for what did in all of the marine reptiles at the same time that, that all the non-bird dinosaurs went extinct is the meteor impact event in Mexico that occurred at the very end of the age of dinosaurs. So meteor hits Mexico. Uh, this meteor, the, it's hypothesized to have been about six miles wide. So when it, it's the size of Mount Everest, a rock the size of Mount Everest, hits Mexico at about 24,000 miles an hour and when it hits, the energy that's released as a result of that has devastating effects on land, but also similarly devastating effects to marine life as well. That's uh, pretty simple enough. Uh, we have a, a, a number of students want to know, when you and Becky go out to look for uh, fossils, do you set out to look for a specific fossil or is it just kind of you get what you get? I would say... Both. And so there are some instances where we go out and we're like, our, our focus is that we're going to go find, uh, say we're looking for fish fossils outside of Fowl. We're going to go look for fish fossils outside of Fowl. Uh, other times when we are, say, prospecting Cretaceous rocks in Nye County, we look at our maps, we see where the rocks are, and we just start hiking. And our eyes are on the ground, the search filter is wide, and you get what you get. That is absolutely uh, exciting stuff. It's almost like a, a big grab bag out in the desert. <laughs> um, so uh, the kids uh, want to know, do you guys ever participate in any other projects besides digging for dinosaurs? Yeah, so both Becky and myself are also geologists. And so we go out and we've been... Uh, funded to go out and try to figure out faults, ancient faults in central Nevada. Uh, I used to teach how to go do geologic mapping. So training people how to go look at rocks. And 
Uh, Becky's also a biologist, has a biology background. So she's gone out and met at bats. And so we're both kind of well-rounded natural historians. And so we like to go out, we like to do biology, we like to do geology. And of course we love the interface of that, which is paleontology. And it sounds like all of those uh, who are interested in studying uh, paleontology, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades and be a little versed on different at, um, different parts of paleontology, geology, archaeology, and almost, you guys are almost like detectives, which is very okay. intriguing. So yeah, uh, you know, one, one more thing, Ralph, is that sure. uh, I should have mentioned earlier, is that to be a paleontologist, you don't have to be a scientist either. Um, we have some... We have one colleague in particular, his name is Brian Eng, who's an artist, and he's a scientifically literate artist, and he goes and does amazing research and makes beautiful recreations of prehistoric life. Um, Becky's going to dig out a piece of his work right here real quick, but he's considered a paleontologist as well, and you can be an artist. You don't have to go on and take calculus in college and things like that. If you're an artist and you love science, you can do paleontology also. If you're a computer whiz, you can do paleontology as well. So I'll just show... Here's a good one. So this is a piece of art that Brian did for a trackway in Southern Utah. And so this is all completely scientifically accurate based upon the rocks that are observed and the animals that are preserved in the tracks. So another good one, this is for the Western, this is one he did for the Western Science Center in Hennett, California of two mastodons fighting. Again, scientifically accurate. So you don't have to be a geologist. You don't have to be a biologist. You can be an artist, you can be a computer scientist. Regardless of what your background is, if you have an interest in prehistoric life, you can study prehistoric life. And maybe if we're lucky enough, we can get uh, him as a guest for the Nevada Science Center guest speaker series, maybe this summer. Um, so we'll, we'll go with one final question. Uh, this is our friend uh, Juan out in Spain, and he had a really awesome question that some kids in Florida were wondering as well. So Juan, you should be able to unmute to go ahead and ask your question. I yeah, thank you. There you go, go ahead, pal. Uh, hi, Josh. Uh, cool. I wanted to know uh, which is your favorite time he uh, of history and why? Oh, my favorite time period. Um, that's a really hard question because there's so many interesting stories and that, that's a really horrible cop-out answer. So I'll actually give you a solid answer. My favorite geologic time period to study is the Cretaceous. Uh, the Cretaceous time period, there's just, it seems to be when dinosaurs were in their heyday. Uh, because our story that we tell through the Nevada Science Center is really centered on Nevada. Geologically, Nevada is super complex during the Cretaceous time period. So it's a really hard story to tell, which makes it all the more satisfying to be a part of. So it's trying to figure out that interplay between what's going on geologically and what's going on biologically during a really cool period of time when animals are doing really cool things and when the geology is really complex. So, you know, tyrannosaurs are running around Montana and there's an enormous fault in Nevada. How does that relate to one another? Uh, that's one of the funnest parts of that period of time that I enjoy telling. Again, you guys are like detectives. It's impressive. <laughs> so uh, before we let you guys go, um, first of all, where can they learn more about the Nevada Science Center? And what do you guys have uh, planned for the near future with the Nevada Science Center? You bet. So go to sciencecenternevada.org. That's our website. Uh, we have our calendar of events on there. Uh, if you have parents or anything that want to support what's going on, we have we can do that through the website as well. We're on all the major social media platforms. So you can check out, the, just look up Nevada Science Center, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And then we have a brick and mortar. So we have a, a place here in downtown Henderson in the historic Water Street District, which will be open to guests hopefully soon this summer. What we have upcoming, we're gonna be going out into the field. We have several research projects, which we are ongoing, digging up dinosaurs, digging up mammals across the state of Nevada under permit from the Bureau of Land Management and from Nevada Division of State Parks. And so hopefully we'll have a whole bunch of new stories to tell through the summer and into the fall. So stay tuned and hopefully we'll have some really good stuff to share with you.